Hi doctors, in this video we are going to discuss pharmacology GT paper. To start, the first question, which of the following amphotericin B formulation is least likely to cause infusion related reactions? Options are A, B, C, D, that is amphotericin B colloid dispersion, amphotericin B lipid complex, liposomal amphotericin B and amphotericin B deoxycholate. This is called conventional amphotericin B. Here the question is, which of the following amphotericin formulation is least likely to cause infusion related reaction? See, all the amphotericin B formulation normally given as IV infusion. When they give intravenous infusion, definitely they have risk of causing fever, chills, or rigor. So, infusion related reaction. Here, question which is least likely causing this problem? The answer is option number C, liposomal amphotericin B. So, when you see the comparison of infusion reactions of various amphotericin B preparation, what Goodman Gilman book says. Among this, amphotericin B colloid dispersion has more chances of causing infusion reaction, followed by conventional, that is amphotericin B deoxycholate. Conventional, C means conventional amphotericin B. Next is amphotericin B lipid complex. And among this, least reaction with the liposomal amphotericin B. This is one important statement given from Goodman Gilman so that this question is framed. Here, another interesting question, what is the major difference between the new formulation and comparison with the conventional one? I go one by one. Most of the common adverse effect of amphotericin B will be, they are given as IV infusion, so causing infusion related reaction, which is more with, the, as I told earlier, amphotericin B colloid dispersion and least with the liposomal amphotericin B. Anyway, the first point, amphotericin B may cause fever, chills, rigor during infusion. It is called infusion related reaction, also called shake and bake syndrome. This reaction can be minimized by prior injection of steroid like hydrocortisone or giving paracetamol or ibuprofen NSAID to control the fever chills or can start some anti-histamines also. Like that this can be prevented. Okay. And next question. Amphotericin B mean one of the most important adverse effect dose limited toxicity nephrotoxicity. This is maximum with the conventional amphotericin B. Liposomal amphotericin B and other LABCD, ABLC, they also have less chance of causing nephrotoxicity. So, one important difference, conventional amphotericin B have more chances of causing nephrotoxicity. Here, there, is some, there will be something called electrolyte imbalance. What are the electrolyte imbalances seen in amphotericin B toxicity? They may have hypokalemia, also hypomagnesemia. This nephrotoxicity is the dose limited toxicity. This can be minimized by maintaining adequate hydration. That is, prior to conventional amphotericin B injection, you should give 1 liter normal saline. So, maintain adequate hydration to minimize nephrotoxicity. Or also go for con the liposomal amphotericin B, it's a targeted drug delivery, less chance of nephrotoxic systemic problem like nephrotoxicity, but costly. Another important problem of amphotericin B, they cause the production of production of erythropoietin that will be causing anemia. So this can be managed by supplementing the erythropoietin. And intrathecal administration of amphotericin B may cause CNS adverse effect like seizure. All these are common adverse effect of amphotericin B. Here most important question, the dose limiting toxicity of amphotericin B in a four toxicity that is most important. Next question. Which of the following antimicrobial agent not useful in meningitis? 
options are isoni acid fluconazole cefazole pefloxacin here simple straight question but little bit tricky question see isoni acid a drug for tb lipid soluble easily crossing the blood brain barrier so this can be useful for tuberculosis meningitis useful for treatment of tuberculosis and fluconazole a anti fungal agent useful for meningitis where is cefazole come on cefazole actually first generation cephalosporin usually first generation cephalosporin having poor entry to cso they cannot able to cross as the blood brain barrier so they cannot be useful for treatment of meningitis so answer for this question option c where is among the quinolone p fluxin a wonderful capacity to cross as the blood brain barrier so p fluxin can be useful for treatment of meningitis here extra question sir look here fluconazole a anti fungal drug useful for treatment of two things useful for cryptococcal meningitis see actually for cryptococcal meningitis the first line drug of choice will be combination of amphotericin b plus 5 fluocytosin 5 fluocytosin actually anti metabolite acting on nucleus inhibiting the nucleic acid in this amphotericin b acting on cell membrane so when you give combination of amphotericin b with the 5 fluocytosin they are super addict to synergistic action so as a very good first line choice following this maintenance therapy by using fluconazole so fluconazole used as a maintenance therapy in case of cryptococcal meningitis of course extra one point fluconazole is the primary first line choice so first line drug of choice for treatment of coccidoidal meningitis so two point we should know fluconazole actually first line drug of choice for coccidoidal meningitis that's one point second point fluconazole can be a maintenance therapy in case of cryptococcal meningitis normally for cryptococcal meningitis first line choice will be amphotericin b plus 5 fluocytosin okay p fluxin among the quinolone having very good penetration power into cso and regarding cephalosporin usually first generation and second generation do not attaining good concentration in the cso so normally for treatment of meningitis among the cephalosporin third generation fourth are very good especially ceftriaxone a wonderful third generation cephalosporin a very good drug for treatment of meningitis okay again one point i told say first to second generation do not have that much entry here one extra point among the second generation we have one drug called sefuroxime sefuroxin actually second generation cephalosporin right? but that may able to have high amount of cs of concentration so the one only second generation drug able to attain in good concentration in the cs so mean think of sefuroxin but in general first generation second generation not having that much role in meningitis that's about this question coming to third question drug inhibiting 5 d iodinase and decreasing the t3 level include all of the following except so super question actually the t4 tetra iodide thyronine in the peripheral circulation converted into active hormone called t3 tri iodide thyronine this conversion done by help of 5 d iodinase enzyme the so question is drugs inhibiting 5 d iodinase there be decreasing level of t3 in cool all except that mean all of the following drugs are inhibiting peripheral conversion of t4 to t3 except like the question so here options are amiodarone propyl tyrosine lithium iodide straight question and says option number c lithium see lithium causes hypothyroidism lithium causes adverse effect of hypothyroidism that is because lithium inhibiting inhibiting release release of t3 t4 from the thyroid follicle from thyroid follicle it is not inhibiting the 
peripheral conversion and incubating release of T3, T4 from the follicle. So, answer is option number C. Whereas, amiodarone, propyl thiazole and ipodate, they will able to incubate peripheral conversion of T4, T3. So, to explain this, look here. Normally, T4, that is tetraiodothyronine, can be converted into T3 by removal of one iodine. The removal done by one enzyme called 5-D-iodinase enzyme. So, what are all the drug incubating this enzyme that by incubating conversion of T4 to T3 includes? We are having beta blocker, the so-called propanolol, propanolol, and then amiodarone, one of the class 3 anti-arimic agent, then propyl thioracil, then steroid, dexamethasone, and ipodates. All these drugs will be inhibiting 5-D iodinase, thereby inhibiting conversion of T4 to T3. Okay, here extra one important question. Propanolol not only controlling the conversion of T4 to T3, Propanolol is also able to control the symptoms of hyperthyroidism like tremor, palpitation. So, Propanolol having dual action, controlling the symptom as well as controlling active T3 formation in peripheral occlusion. Next question, look here. This is another interesting point you should know. That is, there are some non-thyroidal drugs causing adverse effect of hypothyroidism. I will explain this point. Imagine it is the follicle, thyroid follicle. Imagine it's the blood vessel. Here my first interesting question, look here. From in the follicle, T3, T4 hormone getting synthesized and stored. Okay. Now, there is one drug called lithium. Lithium a drug useful for bipolar disorder. Useful as a major therapy in bipolar. This drug may cause adverse effect of hypothyroidism by what mechanism in lithium inhibiting release, release of T3, T4 from the follicle. Thereby, lithium causes hypothyroidism. Another interesting question. In the circulation, T4 converted into T3, that can be blocked by, that what I told in my previous slide, like anti arrhythmic like amiodarone, propanolol can inhibit peripheral conversion. Here, one very interesting question. There are some anti-TB drug, anti-TB drug causes hypothyroidism by inhibiting synthesis of T3, T4. The question for AIMS exam, which are all the ATT, which are all the anti Anti-TB drug causes hypothyroidism. Answer ethionamide and pass. Pass means para-aminosalicylate. Para-aminosalicylate. They will cause adverse effect of hypothyroidism. Among this, ethionamide is the most important drug causing maximally hypothyroidism. And finally, one more question. See, we have one drug called sodium nitroprosic. This we know useful for treatment of hypertensive emergency. Okay. Here, interesting question. Sodium nitroprusate may cause adverse effect of hypothyroidism. How? That's the question. How sodium nitroprusate causes adverse effect of hypothyroidism? Look here. The sodium nitroprusate containing cyanide. It's a cyanide containing antihypertensive drug. This cyanide in the body converted into thiocyanate. Thiocyanate. This thiocyanate having the property of inhibiting uptake of iodine. Inhibits uptake of iodine. Iodine. Because of inhibiting uptake of iodine, the drug going to ultimately inhibiting synthesis of T3, T4, thereby having the risk of causing hypothyroidism. So, sodium nitroprusate also having the risk of causing hypothyroidism. That point you should keep in mind. Next, regarding etidronate, find out the false and true statements. Regarding etidronate. First of all, when you study this question, immediately you should know etidronate. Any drug name ending with the dronate, for example, alendronate. Residronate, Zolidronate. That means they call bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonates. Okay. 
With this in mind, now go through option. Regarding this possibly find out the true and false statement. Option A. Prevent hydroxyapatite dissolution. Yeah. All the bisphosphonate having the property of preventing hydroxyapatite dissolution. Yeah. True statement. And bisphosphonate affect both normal and abnormal wound resorption. Yeah. Very important question. One of the special action of bisphosphonate inhibiting osteoclastic action thereby preventing bone resorption thus with a wonderful first line drug choice for preventing osteoporosis so this is also true statement excreted through liver no 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 bisphosphonate undoubtedly totally cleared from kidney so it's a false statement Bisphosphonate undergo renal route of excretion the unsafe in kidney failure so wrong statement. Causes adverse effect of hypercalcemia? No, false. Bisphosphonate useful for treatment of hypercalcemia, not adverse effect. False statement. So, true, true, false, false. True, true, false, false. That means answer is option A. So, regarding this question, I want to extra point. Look here. Bisphosphonate. First point, you should know what is the important mechanism action. This first point, the main mechanism action, they cause apoptosis of osteoclast. They cause programmed cell death of osteoclast. The osteoclast is the one causing bone resorption. So, the mechanism action of all this first point, inhibiting osteoclastic action. By inhibiting osteoclastic action, preventing uh, osteoclast maturation, that will be preventing osteoporosis. This is done by inhibiting G protein that involved in activation of osteoclast. And bisphosphonates are first line drug of choice for treatment of osteoporosis. So currently, either drug induced osteoporosis or age related osteoporosis. For osteoporosis, currently the first line choice to prevention is bisphosphonate. And they also first line drug choice for treatment of hypercalcemia, very good drug choice for treatment of age disease. Extra point, bisphosphonate nowadays undergo trial, whether they have anti-tumor activity or not. They are trying this in case of CML. So they have anti-tumor activity also. Coming to adverse effect, the old first generation bisphosphonate organ orally, they may cause erosive esophagitis. Overall bisphosphonate causes erosive esophagitis. That's why when a patient taking oral bisphosphonate, advise them to take the drug in standing posture in empty stomach with a full glass of water. The drug should not touch the esophagus. When you touch, risk of erosive esophagitis. And newer drug like our uh, zolindronate or are given intravenous. The intravenous bisphosphonate most common problem, flu-like symptom, like fever, chills, rigor. But the most important adverse effect of intravenous bisphosphonate, nephrotoxicity. They may cause acute renal failure. So before and after infusion of bisphosphonate, check the renal function test. Rarely, rarely bisphosphonate may cause adverse effect of osteonecrosis of jaw, mandible, mandible. This is important. Look here. Osteonecrosis of femur neck. Femur neck mean that is an adverse effect of steroids, corticosteroids. Whereas osteonecrosis of jaw, the so-called mandible mean Think of bisphosphonate and rarely bisphosphonate also have a risk of causing stress fracture in the lateral cortex of the femoral shaft. Rare possibility. Okay. Next question. Interesting question. Image based question. Look here. The cardiovascular response of a normal man were recorded and shown in the figure. This is uh, a yeah, 15 minutes infusion of drug X. They given drug X 
following the drug X, what happened to systole BP, diastole BP, what happened to peripheral resistance, and what happened to heart rate, they given the picture. From the picture, you should find out which of the following drug was the most likely the given X. Okay. So, following X infusion, the response occur here. So, find out the drug X. Options of propanolol, isoproteranol, norepinephrine, methacholin. Here, interesting, interesting, interesting. After using drug X, there is a increase in systolic blood pressure and there is a fall in diastolic blood pressure. It's so one finding. Second, there is a reduction of peripheral vascular resistance. One more thing, there is an increase in heart rates. This is a finding. Now go through your option. Propanolol. We know propanolol, a beta blocker, this will cause a reduction of heart rate. Here there is an increase in heart rate. So ruled out. Then I will come isoprotinol a little bit later, wait for some time. Methocholine, a M2, choline allergic agonist, agonist. This also causes reduction of heart rate. So this also ruled out. So, question can be, option can be either isoproteinol or norepinephrine. Look at the question. Norepinephrine acting on alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, but has no, no significant action on beta 2 receptor, norepinephrine. Now, look here. Since there is no significant action on beta 2, there may not be vasodilatation. There may not be reduction of peripheral resistance and there may not be fall in dash BP. So this also ruled out. The right answer for the question, option B, isoproteinol. Now I explain how this isoproteinol is going to cause increase in systole BP, how it is going to cause fall in diastole BP, how they are going to cause reduction of peripheral resistance, increase heart rate. Everything I will discuss in the here. Isoprotein I am going to discuss further. First you should know, normally we have a formula for blood pressure. Please note, the formula for BP is equal to cardiac output multiplied by peripheral resistance. In this formula, cardiac output responsible for systole BP, whereas the peripheral resistance responsible for diastole BP. This is a fine. It's a fine. Physiology. Now we are going to apply the point. For example, I want to know what happened to BP and heart rate by using isoprotein. It is also called isoproteinol. Isoproteinol is also called isoprenaline. Isoprenaline normally acting on beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 and it has no significant action on alpha receptor. Now work out, since acting on beta 1, we know beta 1 receptor C in the heart, by stimulating beta 1, it will increase cardiac output. When cardiac output increase means definitely there will be increase in systolic blood pressure. And this drug having beta 2 action, beta 2 receptors are normally seen on peripheral blood vessel. By activating beta 2, it is causing vasodilatation. Definitely, there would be reduction of peripheral vascular resistance. This may cause fall in diastolic blood pressure. So, 3.4. The drug increases systolic BP, decreases diastolic BP, and also causing reduction of peripheral resistance. The last one point. Look here. Whenever there is a fall in diastolic BP, to compensate the fall, there will be reflex sympathetic activation. When reflex sympathetic activation happens, means sympathetic. In the heart, we go a sympathetic called beta 1. When beta 1 activated, this may cause reflex tachycardia. So, there will be increase in heart rate also going to happen. So, our question solved. That means what? My drug going to cause increase in systole BP fall in diastole BP and also causing reflex tachycardia. So that image is showing the uh, effect of isoprenaline. That's the point. Okay. The next question.
which are the following antidepressant having maximum inhibitory effect on reuptake of norepinephrine than serotonin look here option given are amitriptyline meprotelin amoxifen clomipramine here one interesting question after all the given options are belonging to tricyclic antidepressant group and we know the common mechanism of action of all the tricyclic antidepressants will be inhibiting inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin so question in general all the tricyclic antidepressant will common mechanism action inhibiting reuptake of both serotonin and norepinephrine but get the question among the given option which drug has maximum inhibitory effect on reuptake of norepinephrine than serotonin the answer for this question option b meprotelin why i'll explain now look here the common example for tricyclic antidepressants are we having clomipramine doxepin imipramine amitriptyline and we also have nortriptyline desipramine amoxifen meprotelin rivaxetin all these are example for tricyclic antidepressant here okay, question the common mechanism of action of all the tca is inhibiting reuptake of both norepinephrine and serotonin so tca sir non selectively inhibiting reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine in this if you look at it, my slide same 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 here i put one demarcation this because these five drugs are preferably inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine than serotonin so these drugs also inhibiting norepinephrine reuptake and serotonin but they preferably inhibiting maximally the reuptake of norepinephrine than serotonin so what goodman says among the tca rivaxetin has most inhibitory effect on drug uptake of norepinephrine next comes meprotelin so in newer question among the given option meprotelin is the one has maximum reuptake inhibitory effect on norepinephrine than serotonin so in ascending order for example clomipramine is a pure non selective pure non selective re take inhibitor of norepinephrine and serotonin as uh, ascending in ascending order as ascending order the reuptake inhibition of norepinephrine is more this is purely non selective it is minimally inhibiting reuptake of serotonin maximally norepinephrine this again maximum norepinephrine as advances this highly selective norepinephrine reuptake blocker next meprotelin so just one point these five drugs are preferably inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine than serotonin this point important okay now extra points are all the tca having some extra property the extra property all the tricyclic antidepressant also having anti histaminergic anti cholinergic and minimal alpha blocking property this is very 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 important okay now another interesting question among the tca we have one drug called clomipramine the clomipramine is approved by fda for ocd obsessive compulsive disorder so question which is the tricyclic antidepressant approved for treating ocd mean clomipramine but remember normally for treating ocd the first line drug of choice will be ssri this point keep in mind normally for treating ocd first choice will be ssri suppose the question come which is the tricyclic antidepressant approved by fda for treating ocd mean answer clomipramine next question doxepin it's a tricyclic antidepressant having very high anti histamine action this again important 
the doxepen having very high anti histamine property thereby useful for controlling allergy itching in case of atopic dermatitis and lichen simplex next imipiramine a wonderful drug that has very high anti cholinergic property following imipiramine having very high anti cholinergic action thereby causes urinary retention because of causing this action imipiramine can be useful for treatment of nocturnal aneurysis but for this condition drug of choice desopressin desopressin a v2 analog of vasopressin so question normally for treatment of nocturnal Now, you know, this drug of choice is desopressin, but imipiramine can also be useful because it has anti-cholinergic action, causing urinary retention. Next, amitriptyline, special, special. Amitriptyline, a TCA, not only useful for treating depression, it is also useful for treatment of prophylaxis of migraine. Amitriptyline useful for prophylaxis of migraine. and also useful for treating diabetic neuropathy pain but in this area you should know amitriptyline can be useful for neuropathy pain but for diabetic neuropathy pain usually the first choice will be gabapentin or pregabalin the gaba analog the so called the gabapentin pregabalin they are the best first line choice for treatment of neuropathy pain the last one extra point i want to tell you look at this we have one drug called amoxapine question look here amoxapine originally amoxapine originally is a tricyclic antidepressant antidepressant the mechanism action inhibiting reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin but what i want to tell extra point it is not only totally having antidepressant property this drug having Additionally, D2 blocking property. So, remember, amoxapine has additionally D2 blocking action. That means having anti-psychotic activity also. So, question: Which is the antidepressant has additionally anti-psychotic action? Mean, think of amoxapine. And because of blocking D2, it may cause adverse effect of gabapentin. and eps so question which is the tricyclic antidepressant causes adverse effect of eps mean think of amoxapine because amoxapine having the property of d2 blocking action that's most important next which one of following serotonergic receptor is a ligand gated receptor Options are five is to one, five is two, five is three, five is four. Remember, remember, remember. All serotonin receptors are G protein coupled receptor. Only one exception is there. That is called five is to three. Five is three alone ligand gated receptor. Okay. So answer for the question option number C, five is to three. Five is to three alone ligand gated. now i will go for extra point look here actually there are seven sub type of seven sub type of serotonin receptors are there that is 5 gets to 1 5 gets to 2 5 gets to 3 like that up to 5 gets to 7 total seven sub type of serotonin receptors are there here first point all the serotonin receptors are All are G protein coupled receptor. Only one exception called five ST three. That's called ligand gated receptor. Here extra point mean if we say a receptor G protein coupled mean it can be either G S or G I or G Q. This and all we discuss in regular class in general pharmacology. Called pharmacodynamic receptor mediated mechanism action. Here, what I want to say, among the serotonin receptor, five is to one is the GI receptor inhibitory adrenal cyclase GI. Five is to two is the GQ receptor. Five is to three is a ligand gated opening sodium ionic channel. Whereas 
5 is to 4, 5 is to 5, 5 is 6, 5 is 7. The 5 is to 4, 5, 6, 7. All these are G S receptor. So 5 is to, I'm repeating, 5 is to 1 mean G I receptor, 5 is 2 mean G Q, 3 mean ligand gate, remaining 4, 5, 6, 7 all G S receptor. So remember, all serotonin receptors are G protein coupled, only one exception called 5 is to 3, 5 is to 3 alone ligand gate receptor. Next. Adenosine antagonism resulting in all except. This is physiology plus pharmacology related question. Adenosine antagonism resulting in all except. Options are arrhythmium, anticonvulsion, diuresis, bronchodilation. There are two ways of answering. If you know physiology, you can answer simply. Otherwise, if you know pharmacology also, you can answer simply. For example, Ardenosin and Ganesum. For example, we have one drug called Theophyllin. Theophyllin, one of the best examples for Ardenosin and Ganesum. This drug can cause bronchodilatation. Useful plasma. So, right. An adverse effect of Theophyllin or Arrhythmia, seizure and diuresis. Seizure. That means Theophyllin going to cause seizure, not anti-conversion. So, answer is option B. So, how to go correctly mean, first you should know physiology of adenosine, then we go for adenosine and agonism. Listen carefully, I'll explain slowly. Look here. First, I'm going to discuss physiology of adenosine. See, actually, adenosine seen in our body in so many areas, in the brain, in the brain, adenosine acting as a endogenous anti-epileptic substance. So, function of adenosine in the brain is having anti-epileptic action. I am talking physiology. And adenosine receptor also seen on the bronchus. So, when adenosine acting on adenosine receptor in the bronchus, it causing bronchospasm, bronchoconstriction. And adenosine receptor also seen on proximal convertible. So, when adenosine acting on PCT causes sodium water reabsorption. It is a physiology. With this knowledge, with this knowledge, go one extra, one extra point. We have something called adenosine antagonist. For example, for example, theophyllene, aminophyllene. All these are methyl xanthine. Methyl xanthine. They call adenosine antagonist. Useful for treatment of bronchial asthma. Okay. Now look at a point. Since theophyllin is an adenosine antagonist, this will block the adenosine in the bronchus causing bronchodilatation. That's why useful for asthma. But question, when a patient taken overdose of theophyllin, in overdose, theophyllin is going to block the adenosine action in the brain, as well as blocking adenosine action in the kidney, thereby causes adverse effect of seizure and diuresis. So it's important. Theophyllin causes adverse effect of seizure and diuresis because of what mechanism? Because of blocking adenosine receptor. In overdose, theophyllin blocking adenosine action in the brain causes seizure and blocking adenosine action in the kidney causing diuresis. Okay. Next point. We have one drug called adenosine agonist called dip. Pyridamol. This drug in olden days it was used for treatment of angina, but today we don't use because this drug causes adverse effect of coronary steel phenomena. So this is not in use. So dipyridamol, a yeah, adenosine agonist, not used nowadays because of causing adverse effect of coronary steel phenomena. Here one extra point. We have one drug called RIC adenosine, a very short acting drug having vasodilate reaction useful in angiography to dilate the blood vessel. Okay. And last question regarding adenosine. Look here. We have, we have adenosine as a drug. Adenosine as a drug used as a drug of choice for treatment of supraventricular tachycardia. So, we have adenosine as an injection, useful for treatment of supraventricular tachycardia. 
here two extra points. How this drug controlling arrhythmias? This drug stimulating acetylcholine sensitive potential. So it's having potential opening property. Okay. Thereby increases the refractiveness of AV node. So AV node is not responding. So there's a delay in AV conduction velocity, thereby controlling tachyarrhythmia. Here two two three point. It is given intravenously, especially given rapid bolus injection. This is important question. Why adenosine given as a rapid bolus injection? Why not slow IV infusion? It has to be given only rapid because adenosine very short acting. T of is less than 10 seconds only. Because of very short acting, this drug should be given very rapid bolus. Why short acting? This is short acting because adenosine rapidly taken up by vascular endothelium. If we give injection adenosine, the adenosine rapidly taken by endothelial cells and adenosine rapidly undergo metabolism by one enzyme called adenosine deaminase. Because of rapid uptake by the endothelium and because of rapid metabolism, adenosine very short acting, acting only for less than 10 seconds. So question 1. The most ultra short acting anti-arrhythmic agent adenosine and it's also drug of choice for treatment of acute supraventricular tachycardia. Next question. Lexipafen is a dash, useful in dash. So new dry doctor. Lexipafen originally Platelet activating factor antagonist useful for treatment of pancreatitis. So just to inform the point, we have lexipafen and what drug? Apafen. Lexipafen, apafen, both are platelet activating factor antagonist useful in pancreatitis. This new point. Then surfactant analog useful for acute respiratory distress. This new point, please note. We have something called Bractan, Boractan Alpha. They are called surfactant analog useful for treatment of acute respiratory distress in premature newborn baby. Serotonin antagonist useful for carcinoid. For example, we have something called Cyproheptadin. Cyproheptadin primarily a H1 blocker, antihistamine, but also having anticholinergic action plus 5-HT2 blocking action. That is serotonergic blocking action. This can be useful for carcinoid syndrome. And NK1 antagonist is useful for vomiting. This is important. We have a lot of examples. For example, we have something called apripatent. Please note, we have something called apripatent. Fast upper patent, roll up patent, new to patent, all or all these drugs are called as NK1. NK1 means neurokinin 1 antagonist, useful for treatment of anti cancer drug therapy induced vomiting, especially useful for treatment of late phase vomiting. When you give anti-cancer drug, they may cause early phase, immediate vomiting, sometime 24 or 48 hours later. So for treating late phase vomiting due to anti-cancer drug, they use this. Because all these drugs have very longer duration action. So a pre-patent, false a pre-patent, roll-up patent, new to patent or anti-emitting belonging to neurokinin 1 blocking group. Next. Cannabinoid antagonist useful for all except, except. This is another interesting question. Options are vomiting, tobacco dependence, drug addiction, alcoholism. Here, why this question they print mean cannabinoid agonist and antagonist. Two things are there. This question cannabinoid antagonist useful for all except. The answer for the question often gave. Why A? For example, we have one something called cannabinoid agonist. Look at agonist like nebulone and dronabinol. They are the one having anti emitting action and appetite stimulating property. So, cannabin antagonist not useful for treatment vomiting. Cannabin agonist are useful for treatment of vomiting. This point important. 
we have nebulo and drone nebinol. Both are cannabinoid agonist, useful for treatment of vomiting, especially useful for treatment of anti-cancer drug induced vomiting. Here one super important point, these drugs are not only anti-emetic, they are also having appetite stimulating property, thereby causing weight gain property also. It's another important point. Okay, that's about cannabis agonist. Whereas can be an antagonist. For example, we have something called Rimana band. Rimana band is a cannabis antagonist. This antagonist is useful for treatment of smoking control or drug addiction or controlling the habit of alcoholism. Look here. Rimana band useful to control smoking habit. It is tobacco useful for control drug addiction. Also useful for controlling alcohol habits. That's Rimana band. But remanaban causes adverse effect of too much of psychiatry problem. So this drug was withdrawn from market, withdrawn from market because of causing psychiatry problem. Anyway, don't get confusion with the agonist and agonist. That's why I frame this question. Okay. I think all the 10 questions were discussed. So please read well, doctor. Each and every second is accountable. Don't waste your time. So do well. May God bless you. All the very best. Thank you.